haven't we? That's something we always say to our children. And I believe that when they leave our homes, they will be morally and legally obligated to do those things. You passing this guideline will help them learn that now. And the parents will rise to the occasion because they will have to. They will have to learn those same lessons that you're teaching their children, and I hope that's a part of your plan. Most importantly, listen to the children. They are committing suicide, they are not getting a good education, and they are living in fear at school while they're supposed to be learning. Listen to them. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Michelle Trasper. Michelle Trasper. Pastor Leonard Jackson. John Haufel. Haufu, H-O-W-F-U. Olga Patrick. Bill Sage. Right here. Good afternoon, board. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I wish it was under different circumstances. I'll give you a little of my history. I'm the founder of Constituting Michigan. If you're familiar with the the uh, Pledge of Allegiance bill, I wrote it. That got passed. And I'm like am a ex-commissioner. I'm on two boards. Community Mental Health is one of them. I'm also on the Regional Community Mental Health Board. I've read legislation. I've written resolutions. Frankly, th this is a bad policy, you guys. There's a simple solution to this, and, and the simple solution is transgender bathrooms. Not, not transgender bathrooms, but unisex bathrooms. That is a simple solution to this debate. Now, it is not this board's responsibility to take parental rights away, because that's exactly what this policy does. And in your heart, if you look deep, <coughs> you're going to know that. You already do know that, actually, because natural law is telling you that right now. Now, you've heard testimony from many young children with no life experience. I've had a lot of it. And I've got friends that are transgender. Do you think I judge them because they're transgender? One's an American Legion post leader, okay? My friend. I play in bands. A buddy of mine named Jason shows up as a woman. Wants me to call him Miranda. You know, it took me two months to <coughs> teach myself to call him Miranda, and he got mad at me for calling him Jason. But I don't recall him going into any bathroom anywhere and getting beat up because he's transgender. Bullying is bullying, I'm sure. You want to see somebody who's been bullied? You're looking at him right now. Okay, in high school, I was probably bullied at least once a month. All right, now, so are you going to come up with policies for short people? You know, you can't. You can't, you can't appease everybody. And again, it, it, it's a simple solution. I'll give you an example. Now, this is a danger. You're, you're opening up many ramifications. Right now, you're talking about superseding <coughs> parental rights. You can't do that. It's unconstitutional, and it's not in your room of governance. Governance is here to protect the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for us. Forward slash property for us, we the people of America. And once you work outside of those parameters, you are no longer working under those rules of governance. Natural law. Natural law comes at, from God. As I am a Christian, I was called a Christian creature today downstairs. You know that? So where's the hate? I love every one of these kids that were here today, but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to repeat it again. They have no life experience. Now, you heard one lady with stats that told you that 80% of these boys that are transgender go back to being boys again. Now, that being said, I'm going to make a comment. When I was young, I used to wear a mustache just like this. It was fake. I used to get into all the bars when I was 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. H was 21 down in Indianapolis, Indiana. I got in anywhere I wanted to. You know why I did that? Because I was a predator for women. Now, you're opening up that gate to all these boys in the high school as we speak, and you, you will end up with legal ramifications from it, and it's on your shoulders, you guys. Because if any of these girls get raped in a locker room, it's on your shoulders. And as a board member, don't do it. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. David Beal. David Beal. Clinton Eccles. Hold on, he's coming.
So I'm sorry, you, what's your name? Clinton Eccles. Thank you. Hi, I come to you today as a Christian uh, father and heterosexual male uh, that happens to uh, uh, be very saddened by the stories that I've heard about abuse and bullying uh, toward LGBTQ students and adults as well, and I'm very sorry for that. I also support LGBTQ students in the sense that they are dearly loved by God and they ought to be respected as individuals and as citizens in our community. I also happen, though, to strongly disagree with your proposal. Um, and I think there's a way that you can come up with a proposal that constrains bullying, accommodates all people, all walks of life, so that they can coexist, but without coercion. Right now, what you have is not right and wrong being debated, but rivalries asserting themselves. And when there are rivalries asserting themselves, there's always loss. And I would really appreciate it if you would come up with a policy uh, that does not allow a person to assert a right that disrespects another individual. I don't know that's difficult, um, but uh, I think it can be done. Um, I'm also concerned about a leap into completely subjective relativism that empowers students to reject truth and command others to conform to their perceived unrealities. If a person perceives he is Superman, would you urge him to fly off the roof of a tall building? Certainly not. Is two plus two going to still equal four in our schools? Second of all, what state law exists that permits this board to usurp a parent's lead teaching and guidance of his children? Thirdly, your proposal places local school boards, and by the way, the word option or optional has been used many times. Uh, optional does not necessarily mean it is not coercive and influential. Your proposal places local school board superintendents and principals and teachers into the crossfire of the culture war. Who now decides how far these shoulds that you have written should be followed? And when a local superintendent, a man that I dearly love in my local school system, and a school board is sued for following or ignoring your guidelines, where will you be? Your reckless document abandons the very people that you should represent. I disagree with the definition of gender identity as being a construct of an individual's internal compass and deeply uh, psychological knowledge of his personal gender regardless of sex assigned at birth. I happen to believe that man is made wonderfully by God by his creator. I hope that I won't be called a hater because I disagree with others who believe otherwise. You've opened the door for mass exodus of students from the public school system and mass lawsuits by playing God, scientist, psychologist, policeman, moralist, and relativist. Where is your research that applies to the fears and dangers felt by individuals that see a person that does not look like their biological sex walk into uh, a bathroom. You quote research from the other side. Where is your research from even 10 heterosexual cisgender individuals? I would pray to you that the idea of empowering a student should not usurp what authorities have already been established to put in place with uh, parents. Um, you quote two pieces of research on, on a premise of unsafe learning environments, uh, but where is your research about what the learning, that new environment you are creating will do to other heterosexual students? I'll just simply end with this. How can any Christian, Jewish, moral, Muslim, or other religious person who holds the belief that God assigns a person gender in the womb and believes that God desires that person to express their sexuality accordingly, how can that person be seen under the language of your proposal as not a discriminator or as a hater? How, how are they going to be respected as a person who simply holds a deeply held religious conviction? A safe solution exists in the unisex bathrooms option. What could be more safe that when something offers complete uh, privacy? Why the endangerment in the name of safety? And why ignore parental rights? I'm against the bill. My wife and I will have to make our own decision about what we will do with our daughter in the coming years because she's in our public school system. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Adam Ray. Adam Ray. Jerry Stike. Susan Butler. Kyla Boys, B O Y S E. She's coming.
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm here as a pediatric nurse practitioner, a parent of public school kids, and a member of the community. And in those capacities, I've seen firsthand the importance of a supportive environment for LGBTQIA kids. I've seen how the robust accommodations and support that are offered at the University of Michigan can support learning and safety and that adjustment to college life. And I urge you to bring that enlightened approach to Michigan public schools by adopting these, these um, evidence-based, good sense, and voluntary guidelines. And I thank you for your work on this topic. And thank you for hearing from me. Extra credit. Thank you for being here. Thank you. <laughs> Kathleen Biker. Michelle Dooling, Jane Kangas, I'll give up a minute of my time if y'all want to stand up and take a break. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm speaking as a Christian grandmother of five students that are in Michigan schools, and I wish to express my opposition to your policy of the mixed gender bathrooms and shower facilities in our taxpayer supported schools. This is a slap in the face to all of our Christian values as expressed in God's word. Where is the protection of our family values and the logical, moral modesty for our children. I don't believe in bullying of any student for anything should be allowed. We've always had girls' bathrooms for biologically built girls and boys' bathrooms for biologically built boys based on our Christian values. And now our culture has created a third group of the mixed gender and they need their own facilities that should be separate from the boys and the girls so that there will be no bullying in the bathrooms or sexual assaults of any kind. We could also have separate facility, um, a unisex facility for one person at a time would also solve that problem. I don't see how our po your policy in this area will improve the whole atmosphere of the students learning the basic three R's that your primary mandate to do so that more students can graduate prepared to make a living and to contribute to our country. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Glenn Kangas. I'll try to be quick. Uh, I think basically I agree with a fella five people ago, the short guy. <laughs> I think we should all have compassion, you know, how you teach compassion and how you legislate that, you know, we should all have love and compassion for everybody, every student. I think that's a, that's a must, you know, we have to agree on that. But I think that somehow, somehow there's, uh, so I agree with the, the tenets of the Great Lakes Justice Center, their publication that I'm sure you, you've been, had, have at your hand. Uh, I think that, uh, how you promote compassion is a difficult one, but I think partly, you know, and, how, and this whole issue of confusion, gender confusion, I don't know what to say about that. You know, you have, you have people on one hand, you have people on the other hand, and how you, how you have compassion and acknowledge the, the confusion that's there, you know, how you deal with that, I don't know. But I think that his, the gentleman's uh, comments and several other people's comments about, about the single occupancy unisex bathrooms has to be one solution. Because I don't think anybody, I, I don't think anybody makes the argument that, that, uh, that gay students are assaulting other students. I think that the, peop, the issue that people are afraid of is that they're going to be men primarily men, I would think, that are going to take advantage 
of this of bathrooms, you know, and they're going to they're go you're going to find young women assaulted. Uh, let's see. So I think that I think again I'm I'm totally against your proposal. I think that it's it's perilous at a lot of different levels, you know, and it should be there are a lot of areas that have to be examined that can't uh, be dealt with. Now to end, I think I. I come from, I'm a machine tool designer, or I'm a retired machine tool designer. And I, I don't know how you approach it, but I think you have to, like, like I do as a photographer, I think you have to, and like I do in machine tool design, I try to get everybody's input, which is what you're doing here, and then I try to think outside the box, think outside my own way of doing it, and think how I can resolve this issue Maybe in a way that you know hasn't been discussed here, but you know I, I I think we're all in agreement. We don't want any we don't want anybody to be beat up. We don't want anybody to be bullied. We want everybody to experience love and compassion in our school system. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Amanda Niven, Matthew Shepard. And he will be followed by Kristen Sheridan. Hello and thank you. I'm Matthew Shepard. I'm a member of the U.S. Taxpayer Party here in Michigan and secretary at that. Just this past week, we passed a resolution, and it goes as follows. A resolution in opposition to SBE LGBTQ student proposal adopted April 30th, 2016. <clears throat> Whereas Michigan State Board of Education, SBE, is considering to implement a policy to favor self-identified lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and or questioning LGBTQ <coughs> students in use of gender specific <coughs> facilities in public schools. And whereas the number of LGBTQ students is notably small in relation to the general population. And whereas SBE is placing an undue burden in creating a new policy to accommodate LGBTQ <coughs> students in the use of long-standing behavior in use of public facilities, and whereas US, US TPM, that's U.S. Taxpayer Party of Michigan, <coughs> finds the LGBTQ sexual behavior dangerous, unhealthy, and immoral. And whereas the Michigan Constitution requires the teaching of religion, morality, and knowledge, therefore, as I said, the Constitution requires our educational system to teach these, not LGBTQ. Be it resolved that USTPM stands in opposition to embracing the adoption of this policy in schools and calls for the resignation of SBE members who support the proposed policy and of resolution. My own personal standing, I'm over 20, 20 years of decorated service. Yes, we had LGBTQ members in our military, but we did not specify use of special accommodations just so they could have their uh, <coughs> facilities taken care of and uh, necessary uh, actions of their bowels or urinary system exposed. This is a drastic measure that you're considering. Every measure that's come down from the bottom Obama administration has been detrimental to this nation. And I would extremely hope that you consider all, not just the small portion of <coughs> favor that supports your proposed legislation. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Kristen Sheridan, Stella Shanaquit, 
Okay, is Shane Schnackwood here? in front of you as a parent. I identify as female. I present as female. But when you get down to it, nobody can see under my clothes. You don't know what bathroom I should use. Nobody knows what bathroom I should use because it's only my business. It's not anybody else's business. When my child came to me and told me that he's transgender, I thought a lot of things. I didn't understand. I was hurt. I took it as a personal affront. I wondered where I'd gone wrong. And I did seek psychiatric services for my child. And guess what? <coughs> the therapist told me your child is not confused, is not seeking attention, is not going through a phase, is not mentally ill, and did not choose to be this way. Your child is not acting out a lifestyle. Your child is transgender. You have a son. And here we are, many months down that road, and I'm still struggling from time to time. It's not easy on parent. It's not easy on child. I'm grateful to have an ex excuse me, access to a supportive medical team to guide us. We live in a supportive school district. Our superintendent has been wonderful and understanding and he works with us to ensure that the school is an inclusive environment. He came with us here today in support. But he's learning too. <coughs> Shane is not the only LGBT student in our school and not the only transgender student. Our school lost a member of the LGBT student community to suicide in February. I didn't know this student, I didn't know this student's family. I don't know his reasons, but I know that when he graduated in 2014, our school was not as supportive as it is now. Our community grieves this loss and I can't fathom the weight of the loss that his mother carries. I refuse to consider the possibility that I can ever understand what his mother has to deal with. I don't care what anybody says, I am not going to identify my child in the morgue. And if you can't understand that and you're worried about who has what in their pants, you need to seek some help yourself. I'm going to address some concerns that I've heard. People that are convinced that boys will act like a girl to go into the girls' room, please raise your sons to know that's inappropriate behavior and they shouldn't do that. Those of you determined to keep these unknown sexual predators out of the girls' room where your daughters are, I want to know why it's okay to leave them in the boys' room with your sons. At least acknowledge that there are female predators, that there are same-sex predators, that there are heterosexual predators, and that there are cisgender predators. And stop hiding your fear of men behind an imaginary fear of the transgender student. You're so worried about keeping men out of the girls' room, you fail to realize you're putting them back into the girls' room. Boys like Shane, who for the most part is accepted as he presents. If he returns to the girls' room, they're not going to be happy to see him there. And how will you ensure these kids are in the right bathrooms? Are we going to employ a panty checker at each bathroom door? Because that includes everybody's kids. It doesn't include the kid that you think is obviously transgender only. Your little girls that you're so worried about, they're going to have their panties checked too. <laughs> Make no mistake. That's obviously not as good a plan as the one that the state board has considered today. Let people pee where they're comfortable. Private bathrooms are not the answer. Excuse me, private bathrooms are, should be available for those who want them, but they should not be the only option. My gender is not neutral. Your gender is not neutral. Not too many people are. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. <laughs> Shane? Shane Aqua? <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Shane, and I'm a transgender freshman at Adrian High School, and I'm glad I'm able to speak here. In an ideal world, all children would tell their parents if they're struggling with something. Unfortunately, we live in a world where there are adults in our lives that not only refuse or to accept or even support their child, but may even become abusive if, they, if the child they were to, share, were to share that they are gay, they are lesbian, bisexual or transgender. I'm lucky to have a really supportive home environment, medical environment, and therapeutic team. But because some of us do not, it's even more important to have a supportive school system. Allowing students to change their name on informal records and request to be addressed by the appropriate pronouns in the absence of parental knowledge isn't keeping things from the parents. It isn't about taking over the parental role. 
It is about providing a student who may have no other store, source of support one safe place to land. When I first came out to my choir teacher and he was open and accepting, I felt incredibly confident and so much more comfortable in my own skin. When someone addresses me as Shane or he or sir, my self-esteem and, self and mood shoot through the roof. Who wouldn't want a kid to feel good about themselves, to experience euphoria like I did? Most people are comfortable with the name that they were given at birth. They don't give a second thought. Being addressed by my female birth name is like a noise a fork makes on a plate. It's all wrong. I have an unusual last name, and I have only been in the school system for 18 months, and most people do not know who my birth name is. But as soon as it screeched over the PA, the whole class with my last name attached, it starts. People find a new wound to pick at, pick at, something to hang over my head and constantly remind me of whenever they please. It makes me miserable. Why is this okay? Kids pick on, kids pick on me, discuss my genitals, my birth name, in hopes of getting a rise out of me. They don't go over, over the edge enough to be considered bullying, but they push and push in hopes that I will react. It gets extreme, it gets vulgar, and I don't always feel safe. Trust me when I tell you that I want in and out as quickly as possible. I have five minutes between classes and no interest in spending as much time in the bathroom. It shouldn't be a big deal. Boys use the boys' room and girls use the girls' room. I use the boys' room. We're here to learn, not to harass and discriminate. This whole thing is a version of the colored and white drinking fountains in the 50s. Being born brown or born gender isn't something that anyone can change. We'll be fine. In reality, most kids are much more open and accepting of differences than their parents. If your kids are uncomfortable, it's because you weren't taught to love each other despite differences. Teach your kids. In 30 years, we will look back at this time as much as we look at the 50s and wonder how we forced an entire segment of our citizenry to use different bathrooms over fear and ignorance. Let Michigan be on the right side of history. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Shauna Daniels. Yep, she's coming. And Kathy Garnott will follow Shauna. Hi, I'm Shauna Daniels, and I am not with an organization. I'm just a mother coming from Monroe, Michigan. And I heard about this recently that this meeting was going to happen, and I thought a lot of different ways on it. And it was nice. I was just going to come today to listen to what everybody had to say about it. <clears throat> so last night I told my daughters that I was going to go to Lansing, so Dad had to get up because he sleeps in because he works nights. And my older daughter, <clears throat> excuse me, she's 11 and she has autism, and she said, you're going to Lansing, I want to go, because she went with her class. And I said, well, you got school, so you got to go there. And then her next question was, well, why are you going? And I said, well, I'm going because they're talking about making a new rule where the boys can come in the girls' bathroom, the girls in the boys' bathroom. And she said, well, I don't like that idea. Um, and when she made that comment to me, it was when, I'm not normally the type of person to get up and talk, when, but I thought about it and thought that she can't be her own voice, so I have to be her voice for her. And she was very uncomfortable with that decision. So I'm here for, for that because I don't think it's right to make a right for someone else that violates someone else's right. And her right, as my daughter, is to go into a bathroom where she feels comfortable also, just like everyone, where the fact is the unisex bathroom is a great idea. Then everybody has their own and they can go wherever they want to. Um, Short story, when she was five and a half, she decided uh, with autism, this, is, this happens a lot, she decided that she was a dog for about six months. She crawled on the floor like a dog. She just, that was what she did. And the doctor said, it's normal, you know, let her do it. And I did, but I did not go out and buy her dog food. I fed her regular food. I didn't go out and buy her a dog house. She slept in her bed. And I didn't go to the school and tell them that to allow her to go outside to pee, but she wanted to. 
Um, so that's basically all I wanted to say was that I want to stand up for the girls that feel comfortable going into a bathroom with other biological girls and that it's okay to have a third bathroom. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Kathy Garnott and Carol Brown is on deck. Good job on my name, Kathy mm -hmm. Garnott. Good, I'm from Alto, right Michigan, today. which is near Grand Rapids, in case you don't know. I appreciate your waiting for so long to hear all of us speak, as is our right in Michigan, to have our voice heard. I appreciate the work that you do, too. I am here against the guidelines proposed. I believe it's too controversial. The, be the beauty of our U.S. history is that we were founded on the Judeo-Christian beliefs and morals expressed in the Bible, authored by God himself. He is the source of truth. Guidelines should be based on truth. <coughs> Regarding the guidelines being discussed today, I want to point to the Bible, Old Testament, first book, Genesis chapter 19. It tells the true story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom is the root word of sodomy, a negative term which refers in part to illicit sex relations man to man. The cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by God for their sexual sins. Next, in the New Testament, book of Romans, chapter 1, clearly lays out rules for human behavior which include not leaving the natural use of men and women. This is God's standard of right and wrong, not human personal opinion. In your proposal, there are references made to child sex at birth. The child's sex is biological, not societal. Children should not be allowed to choose to do something like change names or sexual identity without parental consent. Schools should not bypass parental rights. Public bathroom use is hard enough because of lack of privacy with stalls that have lots of peekaboo opportunities. It would be even harder with mixed use. Also, not just children use school bathrooms, adults use them too. <clears throat> a possible compromise would be to have all children use completely private bathrooms and locker rooms with no look overs, look unders, or look through the cracks opportunities. School bathrooms and locker rooms would have to be completely revamped to accomplish this. It's um, the guidelines won't solve the problems that you're trying to address. I'm praying for God to guide your actions for the future and moral health of our state and my grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for being here. Carol Brown and Donna Secor Pennington would be next. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. I live in Lapeer. I'm a mom, a grandmother. My children already have gone through the public school, so it's really not affecting me in that capacity. However, I do have two grandchildren to consider. <clears throat> to me, this is not about not supporting the LBGTQ students. We all love one another and <clears throat> have compassion for everyone, what we should. What I find wrong with this guidance is it takes away the parental consent over their children's, their rights, and also the rights of the local school board <coughs> decision making. And it goes against the Constitution. <coughs> Excuse me. And we heard testimony way many hours ago from Senator Casperson that there has been successful outcomes with the guidelines, laws that are already in place, that these issues have come up and they have solved some. Um, I would like you to reconsider this guidance, take into account everything everyone's saying, and uh, I think the unisex bathroom is a good choice, a right choice. What I would like from this board in between now and August when you make up your minds, I want to know, because I don't know and I don't know where to go, to find out what specific organization or agencies have initiated this, or is it your own uh, initiation, everybody put into it? So if you please address that online sometime, I'd appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you. Donna Secor Pennington. 
And Lisa Winchell Caldwell would be next. Good evening. Um, <laughs> Michigan. It does sound funny when you say that. <laughs> The Michigan Association of School Social Workers stands strongly in support of the proposed State Board of Education statement and guidance that we're considering today. This policy was carefully developed by a large and varied group of educational stakeholders, including MASSW, and I can report there was very strong consensus on the contents of the statement. We all know that sustainable and effective change requires readiness, and the advisory nature of the statement affords school districts the flexibility to shape policies that meet their own needs based on their own timelines. The importance of these guidelines for school districts is underscored <laughs> by the reality that in a typical class of 30 students, eight students are directly impacted by the gender non-conforming or non-conforming sexual orientation of self, of one or more siblings, or one or both parents. So certainly an issue that needs to be recognized. Research suggests that teachers overwhelmingly believe they have a responsibility to protect and provide a safe learning environment for LGBTQ students. Yet less than half of them believe they're prepared to answer questions or deal effectively with an LGBTQ, LGBTQ student who is being bullied or harassed. Only 4% of principals report that their teachers have, been, have had any professional development regarding addressing LGBTQ students. So, um, and I'm reminded of a story that happened recently in Grand Rapids where a group of third graders on the playground and a student calls another student a lesbian, um, giving you an issue of bullying and harassment. But also when they went back into the classroom, a child raises her hand and says, well, Mrs. Jones, what's a lesbian? That teacher needs to be prepared <laughs> to answer that question to know what the parameters of her school district's policies are and what a developmentally appropriate response would be, and yet, at the present time, that's not the case. Um, MASSW also supports the recognition of the need for family engagement and involvement um, with, um, with these students. Um, and we appreciate that you recognize the role of school mental health providers, including counselors, school social workers, and school psychologists. Their ethical standards and professional expertise and skills qualify them to address the various needs of LGBTQ students and assist in this very important piece of engaging families. And their accessibility makes them very valuable to students who might not have the resources to go elsewhere. My time is up already. So, thank you very much. Yes, but well, thank you very much. So, thank you. Lisa Winchell Caldwell. And Kieran Polka is next. Thank you all. It's been a long day. It's like number 16 here. I, I'm with you. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Michigan Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence as their associate director. Um, I have 16 years of working with victims, survivors, and engaging in the prevention of sexual violence. I think it's important to identify that several people have identified from both sides of the issue statistics from the Centers for Disease Control. I want to thank and appreciate the members of the board that produced this guidance, all thoughtful six pages of it, before I get to the very specific bathroom issue that we spent so much time on today, um, that is in line with the Centers for Disease Control best practices for preventing sexual violence, preventing suicide risk and addressing health equities across several of these components and issues. Um, we've spent a decade studying sexual violence prevention, including understanding the risk to individuals who are transgender. Most national studies put that at about 60% or higher are at risk or have experienced sexual violence. We were able to identify a group of individuals that had that rate of risk um, and not act on that issue and do things that we could to prevent it. 
in any other group, no matter how small, that would be a travesty. Um, so any group coming forward identifying concerns about sexual violence as their primary motivation to not stand in support of this legislation are not using the evidence base around what actually effectively prevents that risk. Fifteen different states have enacted similar legislation and not in the guidance format that you have used, and none of them have produced any data that shows that it increased risk to non-LGBTQ identified individuals. Mm -hmm. Not from their state coalitions, not from law enforcement that were available to discuss it. There's no statistical evidence that this change would increase risk. It would simply reduce risk for individuals who need to access the restroom. Um, so I think that it's important that we bring that component forward that is in line with improving equity and safety for everyone. Um, there are survivors and victims that may feel uncomfortable. That is unfortunate. I have been in a tenuous place where I have to speak for both groups, survivors who want something and survivors who do not before. The reality of risk facing transgender individuals <coughs> is too important and too much of an issue that I think that we have to move forward with the guidance that you've produced. I very much appreciate the thought and effort and evidence base that went into producing it. And thank you for making time for everyone to comment on it. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Karen Polka and Kelly Rabideau will be next. Good evening. Thank you for your time. Girls' self esteem peaks at age nine and then it goes down from there. That's research-based. I'm the founder and executive director of A Beautiful Me. We are a nonprofit charity. We provide proactive self-esteem workshops after school for girls in third through 12th grade with a pinpoint of fifth grade. Since 2008, we have showed positive outcome-based data on the growth of our girls in over 6,000 of them in Michigan. We provide a safe learning environment and over the course of a four two-hour workshops, our girls flourish. At one of the many schools that I work at, the girls are not feeling safe. They are looking for a safe place to go to the bathroom, but it's more than just the bathroom. A safe place to change in the locker room. A safe place to play sporting events that they're playing with, um, mixed company, and to also go on to an overnight camp. Society in Title IX has recognized the innate differences between men and women and has respected these differences by providing separate facilities for showering, changing, and using the restroom. This protects people's rights to privacy and particularly the right for children. In a school setting, to not be exposed to the private anatomy of the opposite sex. I believe in empowering our youth, specifically females. I believe in a safe learning environment for all. I believe God did not make a mistake. I ask that the Michigan Board of Education vote against this memorandum in a safe, for a safe learning environment to be upheld for all of our girls. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly Rabideau and Katie Lowe will be next. Oh, thank you for listening to everybody today. I'm sure it's a long day for all of us. Um, my name is Kelly Rabideau, and I'm the mother of four children and the grandmother of five. Um, thank you for hearing my statement on this very sensitive issue today, and um, I'm going to briefly speak on two of the issues. Um, giving transgenders the use of a girl or boy's bathroom is a crisis, I believe, waiting to happen. I don't believe this will solve the problem of the LGBTQ with self-esteem, anxiety, or depression, not to mention that this will create uncomfortable situations for the other students. Um, I think it appears that we're going to put the other students uh, in an awkward situation to accommodate this small percentage of a group of people. And then there are those that are going to take this issue and abuse it by, you know, whatever, taking pictures or exposing themselves, you know, things like that. And then there are the bullies. They're not going to stop being a bully because of this. It gives them more reasons to bully. For example, a transgender girl goes into a boy's bathroom because she identifies as a boy. In comes the bully. They can be raped, severely beaten, you know, horrible things can happen. This isn't protecting them. 
Um, so we're actually setting them up for some pretty dangerous situations. The next issue is the privacy rule. The school and staff have no right to keep anything from us, the parents, especially something as sensitive as the matters of the LGBTQ. This is a family matter and should be addressed within the families. Um, we as parents have the right to teach and guide our children our moral issues. It is not the right of the schools to override and hide as what, it, what is going on at school with our kids. Um, this is a very sensitive issue and it's 100% unacceptable. And um, one of the things I was, was just thinking about, it's not on my paper, is that I don't know who wrote this memo, but I'm wondering if they're a parent because as a parent, if my child was struggling in this way, I would want to know 100%. And so I think that um, keeping that from us is very, very wrong. So that's just a couple of things. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Katie Lowe Hi. and Thomas Nelson will follow Katie. Hi, thanks for listening today. Um, I'm here today to speak for my children's future and their education, which I feel seems to be a major lack of focus on the state's list of important topics and laws being discussed. In this platform today. It's a difficult conversation to know where to begin and I have only a short few minutes so I'm going to jump right in. A lot of the focus seems to be on the child's sexuality and not the education anymore. My children are five and eight years old. My eight-year-old daughter has to make sure her tank top straps are at least two finger widths long. The girls also have to make sure all dresses, skirts, and shorts are past their fingertips. And my 15-year-old niece's school, the girls are not allowed to wear yoga pants because boys are distracted. But you want to allow boys in the girls' restroom and vice versa. Uh, sorry, lost my spot. You can take away whatever argument you want, but you can't take away that this right down to basic science 101. Male and female, minus the very small 3% of the transgender community, the men's rooms have urinals for centuries. Men don't sit on the toilet to pee, and women don't stand above a urinal to pee. So this small, this small 3% calls for the state to pass laws and fund new bathrooms for schools and all the communities. It's ludicrous. Our children are so far behind in education compared to other countries. We are a powerful country, but lag far behind in education. The U.S. scores below average in math and reading. The American workforce has some of the weakest math mat mathematical and problem-solving skills in the developed world. We scored far below average and better than only two of 12 other developed countries. And these other countries are not just superior to ours, but continuing to better their school systems and their percentages while we have steadily declined and comfortably rested right where we are because the education system is failing our children. So focused on the wrong things. You want to allow, say, a 10-year-old boy named Jeffrey, call himself Amanda, and think as their parents, I don't have a right to know that every single person in the school system is addressing him this way, right down to his school records, but he can't even go to school without shots unless I take a class and forfeit it. And I have to do that every six months, um, regardless of religious beliefs. Let's not forget to mention the fact that they are obviously struggling in some way, shape, or form. And as a parent, I should be involved. I'm actually floored that this is even up for consideration. People are not going to tolerate the school systems raising our children behind our back. I, I want you to give my children an education and allow parents to be parents. As a parent, it's my job to bring up a productive human being to contribute to society, and the school's part in that is their education. You're essentially allowing and helping that child to live a double life, a lie. You want to talk about providing a healthy and productive atmosphere for these children? The focus needs to go back on the education and academics. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. being here. Thank you. Thomas Nelson, followed by Linda Carl Nelson. Thank you. You guys are amazing. What stamina? Holy cats. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. I think this is democracy at its best. First, know that I am the father of six children, five girls, and one son, 12 grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. Know also that my one son is gay who attempted to take his life 
as a young teenager. No, that narrowly averted tragedy occurred mostly because he heard his father stupidly pontificate unwittingly the Catholic Church's denigrating doctrine on homosexuality. That incident where I very nearly lost my most beloved son started me on a journey. A journey in which my statement here today is just one waypoint. It is a journey of working in ministry to the LGBT community for more than 35 years. In those 35 years, I've met hundreds of LGBT people, listened to hundreds of their stories, and talked with numberless parents. I've learned far more than I ever intended, and I cried far more than I want to remember. I have encountered every aspect of LGBT family trials and tragedies. It has been an experience beyond anything one could imagine. I have learned, and I'm still learning. Based on that background, I wish to comment on just two aspects of the guidelines, and I think the guidelines are great. These guidelines seem to be generating some controversy. Number one is the concern I've heard expressed over the potential thwarting of authority of parents. Some parents are concerned that they must be in the loop, no exceptions. I can understand that sentiment. Unfortunately, it is not a blanket truism that would fit all cases. I have witnessed more than a few family tragedies where coming out to parents resulted in disaster. Keeping parents in the loop is not that simple. It's a concept that ignores real life. 40% of homeless youth, 40% are LGBT. How do they get that way? My experience is that they are homeless because the parents could not handle the reality of their, God, their child's God-given nature. Sorry, I'm over time. Coming out is the most personal decision. Each case of deciding whether or when to involve parents should be considered individually because it is absolutely imperative that any decision must ultimately be decided by the individual person involved. No teacher, counselor, or other school official should be compelled to out a young person to his parents. That's it. The second last issue, and I'm just this very brief, is this issue of the furor over bathroom usage. Parental concern about a child's safety does not fit with reality. Transgendered people have been using the bathroom of their choice virtually forever. I challenge anyone to relate when or where such, pass, such practice has resulted in the abuse of a child. It is a non-issue that seems to be mostly the fodder of political pandering. Concerned parents need to be educated that bathroom usage is not an issue born of real life experience. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. Linda Carl Nelson. <laughs> And Deborah Moore is going to be next. <coughs> Good afternoon, and thank you all for your patience and attention during this long day. My name is Linda Carly Nelson. I'm a Catholic mother of three adult children. My, my youngest son is a gay man. My daughter is married to a transgender man. And my other son is a deacon, in, a married deacon in the Catholic Church. So we are a very diverse family. I speak today as a member of a faith which has been anything but supportive of the LGBT community. My husband and I have been involved for decades as leaders in PFLAG groups and in Catholic organizations that work for the equality of gay and lesbian, bisexual and transgender people in the church and in the wider world. As I read many of the negative comments on the guidelines, I was struck by the frequent reliance on religion as an argument against allowing transgender students to use the bathroom of their gender identity. 
in the false assumption that males who are not transgender will use those bathrooms as a means of viewing female students. That argument reminds me of the belief that gay men were responsible for the sexual abuse crisis in the Catholic Church, a belief which has been debunked over and over. The real offenders were not gay men, but men who were sexual predators. It seems that many, if not most people, who object to the guidelines do so out of fear and ignorance. The antidote to ignorance is education about the feared issue. Listening to the real life experiences of transgender students, which we've heard today, could go a long way toward opening minds to the reality of their lives and their hopes for the opportunity to live as the persons they know themselves to be. We're talking here about students in public schools, not people who use restrooms in a Target store. Arguments citing men, adult men, who are not transgender, frequenting women's restrooms do not apply to the school situation. According to the guidelines, transgender students will be supported and counseled by the administration and staff of each school that agrees to abide by the guidelines. These students will be known to the staff and dealt with on an individual basis. Any student who attempts to pretend to be transgender and use the wrong bathroom would be disciplined. Once again, the public needs to be reminded of two things. Number one, these guidelines are not proposed as legally binding, but are available to schools who wish to provide a safe environment for all students. And number two, they were developed as a response to the request from many Michigan school districts for a policy that would provide an equal opportunity for LGBT students to experience a safe learning environment. I applaud the board for proposing these guidelines. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Deborah Moore is next, followed by Sherry Dilbeck. Hello, everyone. Hello. I'm here today as a single mom with some very deep concerns as a mother and a grandmother concerning these. Um, first of all, I would like to know how it was it decided for who participated in the development of these guidelines. I see where there were parents of transgender children who participated in this discussion. Why weren't parents of those whose children have been sexually abused allowed to participate to offer their legitimate concerns in this regard? Why weren't parents of straight children allowed to participate in this discussion? It seems to me this was a one-sided discussion, which is why I am here today. How is it that the rights of boys who identify as girls trump the rights of girls who are born girls? How is it that those of us who disagree are being called haters and intolerant when ironically it's those who are trying to force this issue into, onto others who are the ones being the most intolerant, hateful, and bullying those of us who don't agree into compliance? If these guidelines are voluntary, then why have them at all? Why are they even being introduced in the first place if schools aren't required to follow suit? Could it be that it's a step closer to slowly making them into law and another step closer to eliminating parental rights when it comes to ensuring our children are in a safe environment while at school? The number of transgender students is a very small percentage when compared to those who are straight. How is it that this board is willing to sabotage my child's safety and protection? How is it that this board feels it's okay to invade my child's right to privacy? Before any assumptions be made about me or any false accusations of who I am and why I am here today, I am going to get brutally honest with you. There has been pedophilia on both sides of my family. Four of my five children were molested by their biological father. I fought for eight years to keep my children safe from their abuser. Mr. Austin, do you know uh, who uh, Kathy, please, Kathy please, that's inappropriate. Is? Excuse me, that's inappropriate. Okay, I'm sorry, forgive me. Please. I am nearly 51 years old. I just recently learned a couple months ago from my brother that my sister was also sexually molested by another child who tied her up and fondled her in a locked bedroom of our babysitter's house over 45 years ago with me in the next room and never knew it. I have several family members who are gay, lesbian, transgender, and bisexual. Do I hate them? No, absolutely not. I love my family. 
just because I disagree with their lifestyle and I personally believe it is self-destructive does not mean I am a hater. Let me make something very clear. I am not saying that transgender students would harm my children, even though I might disagree with encouraging transgenderism, but I am very concerned this policy would put all children at great risk and potentially open the door to be sexually abused by those who may pose as transgender students, but really aren't, and have full access to restrooms and locker rooms in our schools. I also feel this could potentially traumatize victims of sexual abuse and would be a serious violation and invasion of their own privacy. I also am concerned for the safety of the transgender student in using the opposite sex restrooms as there will be others who are going to be extremely uncomfortable and therefore per potentially bully the transgender student creating an even more hostile environment. So this is a safety concern for both sides. You have in the third paragraph down of the proposed guidelines the following verbiage. Research indicates that LGBTQ students nationally and in Michigan are targeted with physical violence and experience a hostile school environment more frequently than their non-LGBTQ peers. If this is the case, then why would you be willing to put them in harm's way by allowing them access to bathrooms and locker rooms with which gender they identify? This is pure insanity. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Sherry Delbeck, yes. followed by Christine Heslop. Thank you for allowing me to speak with you today. Um, it's obvious that as I've read your guidelines that you've put a great deal of thought and planning in, into them. And if I had been asked to come to be a part of your, your uh, committee, I would have just added a couple of ideas. One is honoring, and we all want to honor one another. We want our children to honor us. We want, our, we want to honor one another. This is one of the fundamental principles that I live by because my t parents taught me to honor my father and mother and to obey them. It seems as these guidelines, as I read them, are trying to undermine and demean the traditional fam uh, uh, foundation of family and parental rights and authority shifting society to governmental and school control of our children without our consent. Consent of parents is very important. Instead of parents, the school be setting the standards of morality and modesty, conduct, safety, privacy, and acceptable risk. The school will be introducing and guiding children to choose their gender without the support, with the support of LBGQ um, counselors with library material to be provided, and outside uh, leaders that parents may not have knowledge of. In instead of supporting the parents by teaching children to honor their father and mother, you want children to be able to keep secrets from their parents while expecting everyone in the school to acknowledge these secrets. Your guidelines teach and model disrespect and dishonor to parents, to their values and their beliefs, as children are allowed to keep these secrets from parents and are encouraged to have a different name or gender while they're at school. I'm also concerned about all the students and their parents and the employees that are employed by the public schools who will be directly influenced by their, your guidelines. All employees will be expected to receive training and to maintain the climate of support that hides things from parents and encourages disrespect and dishonor. These employees will be expected to agree to your agenda and terms of employment. They will be expected to yield their rights to free speech and personal integrity in order to hold the position as an employee in the public schools. It appears that you have failed to stay in your public role of assisting all parents as they raise and educate their children. It appears that, if you, that you've created these guidelines without fair and balanced research from parents who don't necessarily pre-agree to your agenda. These guidelines to honor and respect the position and authority of parents and public school employees is very important. Please reconsider and write, rewrite these parts we want all children to be safe. And I thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Christine Heslop. 
And she will be followed by Connie Chiapelli. Hi. It's been a long day. <laughs> I want to thank you for allowing us the privilege to come here uh, to speak um, our voice and our concerns. Um, my name is Christine Hesliff. I am married with five grown kids, and I have 17 grandkids and three great-grandkids. I have previously worked for a year with teens in the Waterford Public School System uh, that were going through a lot, and um, I also worked in a daycare as a latchkey coordinator and 10 years with children. My heart is for the hurting, the ones who feel different or left out, and the reason that all started with me is because I know what that's like. When I was 13, I was removed out of school, and I was out of school for a whole year. And I know what that stigma feels like when you have to face your peers at school. I may not identify with the LGBT community on their particular issue, but I know what that stigma feels like. It's a horrible thing to be bullied and treated a certain way. So I'm here to say that I do care about them. I care about how they feel. Um, I have a word picture to share with you, so bear with me regarding my feelings about this memorandum. Many years ago, my life began to spiral downhill. My husband lost his job more than once. We lost our house, our finance, and my health to unforeseen problems. As I worked through my many issues, I often felt overwhelmed and alone with what I was facing. Struggling to have the changes I desired, thinking this would resolve my needs and my wants. After getting what I thought was going to be the answer, a tidal wave of new problems arose. That is why I'm against the statement and guidance for safe learning environment for the LGBT student memo. For the same reason I just stated in my story above. See, it's like when a man goes to dig a well, he only sees the surface. He does not know what lies below. And there's a way that seems right to us often like this memorandum, yet often the end produces a tsunami effect. The memo will shake the very foundation of our state and all the kids involved and our grandkids. And I'm speaking for all the kids. The teachers, the parents, your board members, and our future generation. I collected tons of signatures on petitions throughout the community and almost at a 98% of the people I had spoke with had two major concerns. They were not the, the two major concerns, but absolutely the concern was not against the LGBT community. Their two concerns were, the, 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 but absolutely against transgender, G, GNC students, use of the bathrooms and locker rooms of their gender identity. That's where their first concern was about. They did not want their, their kids in the bathroom with the opposite gender identity. And the second thing was the parents' rights being removed through the privacy and confidentially of a transgender or GNC student uh, that would now be part of the school staff joining together, keeping that from the parents. And so my concern is for the safety of all the kids and the care for all the kids. But this memorandum is not going to resolve that issue. Let's reason together. Let's find a better way for all the kids to feel safe and to have dignity. That's what it's all about. Because if this is put into policy, it will not make anyone feel safe. So my question to you is to reason together within yourself as an individual, not as a group, but as an individual as you come together. Will this solve the deeper issue under the underlining issue? And thank you very much for taking your time today and listening to us. I know it's, it's been a, a very grueling day for all of us. Thank, thank you. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. You. Connie Chiapelli. And Hi, my name is Connie Chapelli. Oh, good. And when I was born, they said it's a girl. And when there was a man born, my husband, they said it's a boy. I am a woman. I am a mom, a mother. I have children, grandchildren, sisters, brothers. I have a sister that practices homosexuality. I love her dearly. And I do not change my stance on this issue because of it, because I want something more for her. 
This issue is a special needs issue in my opinion. There are children that have special needs. The school and public have adopted different things to address their needs and help them function in society, such as a class or classroom, sometimes schools like for the blind or the deaf. We have, however, not disregarded the children that do not have special needs or learning disabilities. You see, the handicapped may always be handicapped. However, they are loved and have perimeters for functioning in a safe and healthy environment. The deaf, the autistic, the blind, the paraplegic. There are those that have broken bones that are not forced to participate in gym. The system isn't revamped to ele elevate them and disregard the rights of others. You have no right to transform the system for a group creating a bullying effect in society. If you make everyone live according to these, those that are mentally handicapped, do you also lose what you have? Freedom, your freedom. When you go to the doctor, do you want to treat hit them to treat you with a prescription you don't need, or do you want the doctors to give you something that's going to cause an epidemic? If the person on the street chooses to be a beggar and make their means that way, don't you have a choice to support them or not? You are not made into a beggar because of their choices. Will you force people to eat sushi because you like it or force everyone to drink liquor because you do? No. Just because someone has cancer, do you? Do you want to receive chemotherapy treatments that are unnecessary? One day you were thought of, another time you were dreamed of, another time you were planned for, other times watched over, cherished, and protected. Without those elements, you wouldn't have been in a structured environment conducive for your growth and learning. We need to afford our children the same things, a future to look forward to, a hope to hold on to, a dream that can be fulfilled by giving them options of right paths to take. If you hold your if you were to tell your parents when you were a baby or young child, don't change my diaper, I want to wear it forever, how much sense does it make for the parent to allow that? Absolutely none. There are teachers and there are students for a purpose. When a baby's born, the doctor introduces the infant as, it's a boy if it's a baby boy, or it's a girl if it's a baby girl. The baby didn't make the decision, neither did the parent. Someone higher than the parent and the child made that decision. We have, the, we have to be honest with ourselves and others and stop living in denial. Denial isn't conducive to healthy thoughts, actions, nor outcomes of a better life. If gardener sows corn, the crop will come up corn. If he sows cucumbers, cucumbers will come forth. What is sown produces after itself, unless the seeds have been genetically altered. Lies produce lies. We, uh, we agree there is, I agree there is a special need issue at hand. Those that are gender confused need to have a place for them, not in the midst of those that are confident in their born identity. I do not support this bill. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Jimmy Cipelli. My name is Jim Chappelle. I don't know what else more that I can say other than what she said, but I would like to say that I am vehemently opposed to this proposal. It's not the proposal. That's a simple solution. You know, and it, the, the solution to that is that we have gender-specific bathrooms for these people. For, uh, that's simple. We've made it really complicated. I guarantee you that that's going to be a lot cheaper than having all the losing funding for the schools from people who who say they're going to homeschool. Now, here's here's my problem. Okay, I'm tired of people coming to me and telling me because I don't believe the way that they do that I'm either homophobic or a hater, because that's just not true. I worked in the hair business for 35 years. Do you know how many gay and lesbians and transgenders that I worked with and worked on? Listen, I loved every single one of them. Did I treat them differently? Yes. Do you know why? 
they have a softer heart than a lot of other people. But that doesn't mean that we can allow... When did children start making the decisions for us and what we're going to do? Listen, if that's the case, then what we need to do is we need to start saying, uh, okay, let's remove all the Senate, all the House of Representatives, and let's remove all them. We're going to bring in a bunch of eight-year-olds. They're going to run the country and make all the decisions from this point forward. This is not a transgender thing. To me, this is an LGBT thing. This is, they are trying to force what they believe on us. Now, many, many years ago, I was a certain person and I lived a certain type of lifestyle that was very inappropriate, okay? Now, I tried to convince as many people as I could that that was the right lifestyle because I felt the more people that I could convince, the more I could believe it myself. So in closing, I have 14 minutes, I'd like to say what? seconds, but <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> I am vehemently opposed to this. And I, you know, I'm tired of them telling me that if I don't believe that the way they believe, that it's going to cause their children to commit suicide. I'm just sick of it. And I think I represent the majority, not the minority. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Beverly Sue Moore, followed by Anne Marie Riker. My pastor, <clears throat> when he goes to speak, he always says, look at me. So I'm asking you, look at me for a reason. I haven't got a speech prepared for you today. Matter of fact, I've been sitting there for five and a half hours <laughs> because I've come today to talk to you from my heart as a mom and as a grandma. I've heard a lot of different things out there today. And the main thing I want to share with you today is it's not about love or compassion. It's about responsibility and accountability. And that has to do with you. I was thinking out there, one lady talked about the boogeyman. And I thought, what about my little great-granddaughter someday that's in first grade and she goes into the restroom? You see, she's not afraid because she's trusting you, the school board, to make decisions on her behalf. She's not even thinking about being afraid of anything. She's too young and innocent. So my heart today is, as a great-grandma someday, that I don't want to look on the 5 o'clock news, and I'm sure you don't either, and see a picture someday of my little great-granddaughter that's been abused by a pedophile in the bathroom, not because she was afraid, because you see, she was too innocent, she was too trusting. So I'm asking you today to make a responsible decision. I'm not for this proposal, but I am asking you to think about this, about a little girl, maybe in first grade, that's been abused by a pedophile, and her heart has to bleed with pain for the rest of her life. And God bless you. I don't want that blood to be on your hands. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Anne Marie Reichert and Jamie Adcock will be next. She had to leave. Okay. Uh, Victoria Miller will be next. I come before you as a mom of a 10-year-old boy who is highly intelligent, and we recently met with the board to talk about how we can advance him because he's too smart. And the next day met with the special needs team for my five-year-old daughter who is severely behind. Um, at my daughter's 18-week ultrasound, we were thrown onto a roller coaster ride that I wanted nothing to do with. I wanted off that ride, but I wasn't allowed that choice. 
my daughter was born with a major heart condition, which brought her into three open heart surgeries her first two and a half years of life. Unfortunately, that was minor issues. We have had so many other issues, not eating by mouth. My feelings were so torn apart at that time. I wanted nothing to do with it. I wanted God to heal my baby, but you know what? He didn't. I had to walk through the fire. I had to force a tube down my daughter's nose every day for a year and a half so that she would live. I hated it. I felt like I was torturing my child, but I did it because I loved her. It wasn't about my feelings. My feelings wanted to run out that door and get in the car and go down I-75 to the nearest bar in Florida so I could relax a little bit. Feelings can mess with us. Feelings, as a 14-year-old, that made severe errors of judgment that I have regretted to this day. So I just, feelings and making decisions as a child that they could future beat themselves up over and over and over. We all make mistakes, okay? But I have a 10-year-old son who has watched and been put on the back burner because of her, who has said, Mommy, I don't feel like I'm loved. I feel like you love her more. And I've shown him countless ways, I love you just as much, and you matter just as much. But she trumps us all. But through that, and through my husband's cancer treatment, I was able to build a relationship with my 10-year-old son, who just wrote me a note and said, I am so thankful for the bond that we have created through these hardships. I have an amazing relationship with my son, and I am so thankful. We can be real, we can be honest, we can make mistakes. I tell him, okay, I screwed up, and I am sorry. But I grieve at the thought that if my son was struggling with identity or... <laughs> You know, regardless of that, there's a million other issues that he could struggle with as he's growing up. Growing up is hard, and I want him to come to me. And I want the school social worker, psychologist, to get involved and say, we want to help your family. We want to help your family bond. I want to be there for my son, even if he do I don't agree with what he's doing. I did a lot of things that my parents were like, my mom would say, Larry! Talk some sense into that girl. But I want the opportunity to be invited in. If my son wants to be called Susie, I want to know. I don't want, I don't think it's right to the child or to the parent to be excluded from that. I want the opportunity to build my relationship with my son. And no, life isn't easy. But you know what? I want to go through it with him. Thank you. Thank you. Victoria Miller, followed by Hannah Miller. Good evening. Hello. My name is Victoria Miller. I'm from Waterford, Michigan, and I have no children. I'm here because I am a college graduate, and I seriously value student safety. I feel the proposed LGBTQ guidelines for the bathrooms will hamper a school in its efforts to provide a safe learning environment and to prevent student bullying. It will, in fact, solve nothing but open the doors to those who would exploit the guidelines for their own devices and gratification. For example, under the current guidelines, a 16-year-old boy, not a transgender, may declare himself to be a girl. He may <coughs> enter a girl's bathroom or locker room at will. He may retain his cell phone. Young girls cannot request his removal. Those <laughs> girls have now lost their right to privacy. They will be afraid to change in a locker room or to go to the bathroom or even of going to school. Those girls will become victims of peer pressure and bullying. When they speak out and say how uncomfortable they are with the boys in the bathroom, the girls will be called intolerant haters and um, transphobes by other students. I can attest to this, I have had this at college. I mentioned I was uncomfortable having a transgender in the bathroom, and they're like, oh, well, you're just intolerant. I just mentioned that I was uncomfortable with it. It's like, I'm okay, but I'm uncomfortable. So I can, this is a true story. 
Um, these guidelines will create exactly what girls, or excuse me, what schools wish to prevent. The situation will cause confusion and fear in schools. This is extremely upsetting as people, transgenders included, just want to use the bathroom in peace. So a solution. Please don't take away the majority's right of privacy so that a minority may feel safer and more comfortable. Instead, let's find a solution that all students may feel comfortable and safe. Keep bathrooms distinct and separate. You can use the bathroom that corresponds to your legal birth certificate. This will be safer but uncomfortable for many. So unisex bathrooms should be provided and their use encouraged. I personally am uncomfortable using the same bathroom as a man and believe that it would be safer for the students of all genders if unisex bathrooms were used instead of co-ed. Thank you for hearing me today. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Hannah Miller. And then Carly Allen. Hello, I'll be glazing over about now. You guys are amazing. <laughs> I just would not be able to handle this. But I'm here today. I just want to thank you for letting me express my opinion and the First Amendment right. I am actually against this um, proposal that you have made on three or four things. The first <coughs> one is, is that you contradict your first thing on page two, um, providing an appropriate and meaningful family engagement and support. You turn to page four, you said that the parents don't need to be involved. They don't need to know the children's name. They don't need to know what goes on at school. I think that is wrong because our parents need to be involved with our children because they are what they live with at home. They are the connection that we have to the outside world. Actually, what happens at school is probably not even as much that we will we gain our knowledge to go out into the working world through our parents and the responsibilities that those parents have. And speaking of responsibility, is it our responsibility and our rights as parents to make sure our children are safe. Uh, I don't think <coughs> letting them, the, what gender they identify with going into the bathroom is safe. If you are born <coughs> with an atomically correct either gender, whichever one you choose, you should be able to go into those. I do say you create unisex bathrooms, but the locker rooms, you should keep boys to boys, girls to girls. Just because there is curiosity on both sides. Little boys can be hurt, little girls can be hurt. Let us separate that and make that where they aren't. Because I'm not talking, you know, transgender people, it's not about really them I'm worried about. What I'm worried about is the actual pedophiles that will use this to their advantage. Because they will say, you have given me permission. I feel, right now I identify as a woman. I've raped that little boy or little girl. I've molested, I've done what I wanted to, but now I'm a guy. I can go back to what I want. I think that is wrong, and I think we need to stand up with that responsibility and say no, even though we are being peer pressured into changing our ideals to help them feel comfortable. I don't think it's right that the majority should suffer at the minorities thinking that they don't <coughs> have the right. And I appreciate every one of you for coming out and letting us say this and even coming up with this proposal, the hours you spent working on this. So I ask you, though, please, Keep our children safe because our children don't need to learn about sex education at four and five. Let them be children. If I'm worried about what, like a five-year-old is what gender they are, they're not having a life. Don't let us force this down our kids' throat. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Carly Allen, followed by Michelle Molina. <coughs> Carly Allen here. Oh. Thank you so much for listening to us and saying so late. I know this has got to be trying. <laughs> um, I just want to state that um, a few statistics I found. 3.8% of Americans are LGBTQ community. 0.3% of Americans are transgender. 96.2% are non-LGBTQ completely. Um, the statistics of rape under the age of 12 is 22 percent, 54 percent under the age of 18. In a given school year, 58 percent of 7th through 12th graders experience sexual harassment of some sort. 62,939 cases of child sexual abuse in 2012 alone. I couldn't find anything any closer to this date. This is not an issue of equality or anti-LGBTQ. It's an issue of safety, and I am against the guidelines. It is proven that children are not mentally capable of making responsible decisions, such as tattoos, piercings, smoking, drinking, joining the armed forces, and cannot consent to have sex until the age of 18. 
legally. So why would we entrust them to make a decision on what gender they choose or identify with? I'm sure most transgenders, if not all, have already been using the bathrooms of the gender that they identify with as adults. If these guidelines go into effect, it opens doors for predators as well as drawing negative attention to the transgender community as well as the entire LGBTQ community itself and will cause bullying to elevate, especially toward the LGBTQ community, considering that the LGBTQ community is only 3.8%. Parents need to know everything going on with their children, in and out of the home, within school especially. Without knowing what is going on with our children, how are we supposed to support or counsel our children? It is bad enough that children want to hide things from their parents without the school staff keeping these things from the children as well. Children don't feel comfortable talking about sex with their parents. Children don't feel comfortable talking about their sexual orientation or their gender of choice. It's a very uncomfortable subject to speak to with your parents, and I'm sure all of us can understand that. But as parents, we need to know and be able to guide, comfort, and support, counsel our children completely against this. And I'm sure that we can find a better way of going about keeping every child in the entire school district safe. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Michelle Molina. And she will be followed by Jose Ibarra. Thank you for having us here. My name is Michelle Molina. I am gravely concerned with the proposal that has set forth here in the Michigan Department of Education. As a mother, I am appalled that anyone would think that it's okay to let their children live a double life at school while leaving the parents in the dark. Not only is this an action um, preparing adolescent for a secrecy life of dishonesty and as if it's okay, but potentially causing Family conflict, under, family conflict, and undermining parental authority. This is the reason why people are not able to vote, enlist in military, buy cigarettes, or apply for a credit card until they're 18. That being said, no one has the right to withhold information from a parent about their children, give false advice about serious life matters, nor give consent to change names, choose restrooms, or about any other matter. It's my child. It's my right period. The bathroom locker room situation um, should be just common sense. This is no reason to let boys and girls bathrooms nor girls and boys bathrooms. This is not going to accomplish the happiness or safety that, propose, that proposal thinks it may bring. It is, the long run, it is the long run the student knows the truth and I do not want my daughter in the bathroom with any boys. Do you really believe that boys care if a girl thinks that she's a boy? Absolutely not. I personally understand that adolescent years can be tough time for many children. I do believe that every child should feel safe and free um, from harm, whether in school or not. Throughout the proposal for the LGBTQ students, this concern, safety is highly stressed. That is bullying issue. Once again, all kids need to feel safe. And if the school district starts to implement and educate a no tolerance for bullying, school, for bullying, schools will be a safe, safer for all. And that was written by a good friend of mine that's also a sister. But as a victim, I want you guys to hear this. This is not an LGBTQ issue at all. This is a safety issue for our children. A young man victimized his first child at the age of 11. So pedophile starts at a very young age. He didn't get the help he needed, nor his parents sought for help, nor the parents knew. I became his second victim when I was 11 and he was 17. My daughter is 12, and I do not think it's safe for her to have a bathroom where anyone can just walk in. My daughter also feels that this is wrong, and she is very uncomfortable with it. So I am her voice. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Jose Ibarra and Victor Torres will be next. Good late afternoon. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your service. 
Um, a lot of things that I had on my notes have already been spoken, so I won't beat the dead horse. Uh, but I do want to ask you, um, what is your plan to protect the LGBTQ students once this happens? What is your plan to protect non-LGBTQ students? Because you're really opening a door for bullying. You already have a policy for bullying. You haven't done anything with it. We need to set that in place before you go any further. I urge you to table this issue until you can get a handle on the bullying policy. Because once you open this door, there's no going back. There's no going back to fix the bullying policy. And you have to fix that first. You know, there's a wise man that says line upon line, precept upon precept. You can't skip lines. You can't skip things and expect a good outcome. I implore you to review this and set it aside until you can fully secure the safety of each and every student. Not just LGBTQ students, but non-LGBTQ students. I also want to want to commend each and every one of you. I've actually Googled each and every one of you, and, and, and I want to, to really thank you for the accomplishments that you've made that make you the people you are today. And I want to remind you that you did not get all your accomplished by feelings alone. All your accomplishments did not come because you felt, I don't feel good or I don't feel bad. They were by hard work and perseverance. And I implore you today, do not let your hard work and perseverance be swayed by feelings and emotions. This is an emotional topic, as many of you have seen today. However, we need level heads and knowledgeable people, not emotional people, making this decision. Thank you so much for your time. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Victor Torres and... Linda Cypret Kilborn. Good evening. My name is Good Victor evening. Torres. Um, thank you so much for just doing what you're doing. I know that this has got to be extremely huge, huge on your conscience. Uh, you know, I was going to come to you as a father here tonight, but uh, I, I really need to come to you as, as what uh, I do. I'm a minister the gospel um, and it was very eye-opening to be able to see so many different people's uh, opinions uh, so many people's uh, stances and and where they are and what they think and and I, I sat back and I wondered do all of you already have your minds made up uh, it's just it's easy for me to, to just look at that and I just wonder is anybody's thoughts and concerns here really adding up to make any kind of difference in your life um, or in the decision process and, uh, and I think about the LGBTQ uh, individuals, um, and my heart goes out to them. They, they really do. Um, you know, I really don't know what is ministered in many other churches, but uh, I know what we minister at our church. Um, but I will tell you this, uh, we don't compromise the gospel. But at the same time, people are people. And so when you take a look at this, uh, I just need to ask this question to everyone, actually, uh, that's involved in this, is we're talking about discrimination here. But why is it that when people have a particular core value or morals, why is it that they can feel discriminated against and nothing is done about them? Why is it that they can uh, not express what they don't want to be a part of, but we're expressed as haters? Why is that? You see, and in, in our church, I mean, we, we love people, we really do. But I have to ask the LGBTQ community that, do you realize what's happening to us as Christians? Do you realize uh, how that we're being discriminated against? Um, are you looking at that as a whole? I mean, here we have children, our children that we're going to have in public schools and that we're raising them up with particular morals and values, not to hate uh, LGBT community people or anybody for that matter, but, but why is it that we get put aside and say, you know, who cares about you in essence? This is happening all over the place. You can see it, okay? But I need to ask the LGBTQ community is that, do you realize what you're doing to us? You talk about love. 
But do you realize the position that you're putting us with our children as to how we need to be able to explain this and how we need to be able to explain what's going to happen in the restrooms? Unisex bathrooms is, is, is a very good <coughs> place to start with. Um, when we raise our children and give them an understanding of so many different people's values and morals and not to discriminate against them, but, but please, don't forget, we're being discriminated against as well, too. And if you really want to talk about love, then let the LGBT community come up with other solutions that would help everyone, not just this particular policy or proposal that I'm against. Thank you. Thank you for being here again. Thank you. Linda Cypert Kilborn. And she will be followed by Sandy Cal. Well, I can say good evening. And I am here to speak out about a different issue. Abaju, Aninishna, Ajawana Nimkikwe Dishes Nakas, she condoted Ports of the Kalamazoo River in Donjaba, aka Linda L. Cypert Kilburn. I'm from Marshall, Michigan. Greetings, my name is Southern Thunder Woman. And I would like to let the State Board of Education know that my right to speak, my free speech, at the Pawpaw Redskin School Board meeting was denied by the President Karen Ayers at the public participation portion on April 13, 2016. And as you know, Papa is a public school system. I'm asking the State of Michigan Board of Education to send a representative to the next Pawpaw Redskins School Board meeting to witness whether I will be granted the right to speak at the public participation or will I be, not be denied my right to speak again. The next meeting is Wednesday, tomorrow, May 11, 2016 at 7 p.m. I will be protesting outside before the meeting to assure that my freedom of speech is acknowledged, at least outside of the meeting. Indifference to the rights of Native Americans is racism, and this base American right should not be an issue. My comment in the April 13, 2016 meeting was to address the racial slur of Redskins of the Pawpaw High School, using the Native American spiritual leader head as a sports team logo and the nickname of Redskins. A redskin is a bloody body part of skinned Native Americans who were hunted for bounty in our country's past. As you know, every child is entitled to a healthy living and learning environment in public school systems. The nickname redskin does not allow for this. My right to speak on this subject has been violated. I would like to say Chi Miigwech the State Michigan Board of Education for its support and the resolution that was issued. A lie does not become truth, and wrong doesn't become right, and evil doesn't become good just because it's accepted by a majority. Justice delayed is justice denied. Give me my freedom of speech. Thank you. I'd like to leave these. Sandy Cowell is next, and Jeannie Cagle. Sandy Cowell left? No, Jeannie Cagle. Oh, here, this is Sandy Cowell, right? Yes. Okay. And then let's see if Mr. Michelle Strange is here following us. Okay. Patrick Rouse? He's here. He's here. Okay, so Sandy. The LGBTQ proposal contains many complex issues regarding our children. I disagree with the memo because you want to include the LGBTQ content in every subject, such as English, language arts, creative arts, and health education. In the memo, it states on line item number five, and I quote, inclusion of LGBTQ topics in curricula in areas such as social studies, English language arts, creative arts, and health education, including sex education, end quote. In creating this memo, you are alienating the two largest religious groups in our state, the Muslims and the Christians, who believe this information should be left in sex education classes. Many of them already opt out of sex education for their religious beliefs because they believe they should teach their children about sex, sexual orientation, not the school. 
by including what this board states is the discovery of sexual orientation in every subject, you will force the parents from these two groups to remove their children from our public school system. I read recently from Matt Sharp, ADF legal counsel who represents 63 children in a lawsuit against a school district imposing similar proposals and the Department of Education, and I quote, no government agency can unilaterally redefine the meaning of a federal law to serve its own political ends. The Department of Education is exceeding what is legally and constitutionally called to do, end quote. Is this board ready for this type of lawsuit? Because based on our interactions with the parents in Michigan, you will either have a massive drop in attendance and or a lawsuit from angry, angry parents. I'm just asking you to stand with us, the parents, and find a better way. This is not it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick Rouse and then Nicole England. Good evening. Good evening. I'm here to provide my comments on the memo for safe learning environments for LGBTQ students. This issue has plagued our nation with division. We have one side of the argument screaming to be heard and to be set free and the other side closing their ears. I submit to this board there is another side. President Obama recently said, and I quote, in democracies, everyone should want more information not less, and you shouldn't be afraid to hear an argument being made. I'm here to present this board with another side of the argument. This is a complex issue, and we cannot handle this with the same tactics we handled every other civil rights challenge. It is just not the same. In the past, liberation has brought forth growth and celebration with new freedoms. After the Civil War ended, African American slaves were set free. Did they commit suicide because they were liberated? Obviously not. When women gained the right to vote, did they rush to commit suicide? When segregation ended after the tiresome works of late Martin Luther Jr. King Jr., did he oppress, did the oppressed commit suicide? When the first African American was elected president of our great country, did he turn to commit suicide? The answer to all these questions is absolutely not. But with the transgender community, Liberation has brought forth a lack of hope and more suicide. This is not the same issue. Dr. McHugh at John Hopkins University, one of the first universities to perform transsexual operations and devote an entire wing to this service, finally asked the most important question, is this helping? The answer was a resounding no, and they closed the wing down. Doctors Eilenfeld and Benjamin came to the same conclusion after providing sex hormones and surgeries to over 500 patients. Eilenfeld said, and I quote, there is too much unhappiness among people who have had this surgery and too many end in suicide. The CDC and the Youth Suicide Prevention Program state the transgender adolescent continues to have a 50% suicide rate. Walter Heyer, who underwent gender reassignment surgery and lived for eight years, as Laura Jensen recently stated, and I quote, negative outcomes are only acknowledged as a way to blame society for its transphobia. This memo you have drafted is not considering the idea that these actions will accelerate the problem. The Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network in their report titled Harsh Realities stressed the importance that every child learn to respect and accept all people. Their report showed that the bulk of assault and harassment for transgender students happened because of a lack of acceptance in the schools by other students. To become the top 10 in 10, we need to focus on each student, not more memos and procedures. We need to set goals for our state that include the value of life, no matter how pe different people are. I'm almost done. I have spoken with a number of faculty across this great state, and they all say the same thing. Instead of more rules from the state school board, we need support to help create an environment for respect for every student. There are already anti-bullying measures in the school system. We need to do a better job at acknowledging that bullying is unacceptable for everyone. <coughs> we need to stop this memo and get to work. Members of the state school board and the, LGBT, the LGBTQ students need you to consider there is a better way. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Nicole England. And she'll be followed by Scott Vonay, or Vonick, maybe. I was here last month. I am Nicole England. I was here representing my daughter who has been bullied by a person who identifies with the LGBTQ community. I also spoke regarding my son who has special needs. Today I come before you again with a petition of parents who were unaware of these, need, these guidelines. Their response was, what? Wow. No, this is not okay. Where do I sign? As you can see, the majority of the parents you are supposed to be representing disagree with these guidelines. I also spoke with a person of the LGBTQ community. His response was, I think it's ridiculous. I asked him to be here today, but he could not due to the prior engagements he had. He did ask me to read his thoughts on this. My name is Matthew Paulus. I grew up in the public school system. As part of the LGBT community, with myself being gay, faced certain situations where I would be bullied and harassed about my lifestyle choices. Along with being overweight, it was something that I feel no one should have to endure. I developed a thick skin early and didn't really pay attention to the negativity surrounding myself. Other kids in the K through 12 may not take this approach. It may hit them emotionally harder than others. Bullying is a huge problem in the public and private sector of education. And I believe the actions taken by the Michigan Department of Education is not the right way. Children, teens, and even some adults do not know what they want at any age. Children and teens specifically are influenced by current trends, media coverage, and the opinions and thoughts of others so much that they have a hard time making a decision on their own. I feel as though the proposed guidelines made by the Michigan Department of Education should not be allowed to pass. That signed Matt Paulus. For myself, the law states children under the age of 18 are the parents' responsibility. They cannot, they cannot voice on this matter, but yet you are willing to surpass the majority of the parents who represent these children. We oppose these guidelines, and we think there is a better way. And I do have over 70 signatures that I represent as well, and I brought my statement from last month. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Scott Vanek, is that? It's pronounced Vanek. Vanek, okay. Yes, and Terrence Redman will follow Scott. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate your time. It's all been stressful and emotional for all of us. Um, I would first like to say I'm a father, a stepfather, an uncle, and also a mentor. Other people, you know, I try to respect by giving my my mistakes in life, as we all have had them. Um, and I'm outraged by the fact that the minority gets to say they strip my father rights away. All these years, everyone has, from the court system has badgered about how fathers need to be more involved, how fathers need to step up. But right now, your decision is stripping my father rights down to be where I am treated and looked at like rest of the population see most fathers in this United States, deadbeats. We're out of the picture, but not all of us. There are those who are standing up <coughs> to support and to be with our children. My children, rather, if they come out to say that they're gay or lesbian or bisexual, I'm still going to love them. There is a difference between saying, as a father, I am proud of my child for being my child. I am proud of my child for being a doctor, or I'm proud of my child for being an uh, outspoken uh, lesbian or gay individual. There are three pictures to it. Do I have to support all three of them? No. I have the right and obligation to support my children as my child and as their <coughs> occupation, as what they do personally. That's where I can stand my ground and say, I don't agree with this. I will support you to the best of my ability, but I do not have to support that aspect of your life. And with that being said, I appreciate your time, and hopefully you guys make the wise decision over this. Thank, Thank you. you for being here. Thank you. Terrence Redman? He's not here. 
Thank you for telling me that. Crystalyn Musselman. Sarah Giddings. Wade Hoppy. Okay, and Wade will be followed by John Wilkes. Good evening. Uh, my name is Wade Hoppy, and I am a resident of Van Buren Township. I'm here as a parent, and um, also, I guess I'm a businessman as well. I uh, I wanted to, um, I guess, uh, express my opposition to your proposed policy, uh, and based on a few different reasons. Um, I guess uh, the the first is that the current policy of segregation by biological sex is perceived to be discriminatory and um, whenever an action is slapped with that label uh, it automatically seems to be said to be out of bounds well, we can't have discrimination against anybody for any reason but that isn't really how our laws work we discriminate against people all the time our laws are designed to mediate between opposing parties that's why we have laws and it always favors one group over the other. Uh, if the um, republic is working properly, the laws should favor the will of the majority. That's why we call it uh, consent of the governed. So to dismiss um, a policy because it's perceived as discriminatory, I think is deceptive. Um, in addition, I've heard some comments uh, that have been passed around by people who have supported this proposal, and uh, they have said that, uh, well, opposition to this proposal that is motivated out of religious principle is somehow disqualified, that that, is, um, that also is not to be considered. And I think that that's wrong because um, all laws originate from somebody's moral conviction. All laws come from someone's deeply held conviction. And uh, as far as the law is concerned, the origin of those convictions is irrelevant. Each citizen feels strongly about a policy. Uh, it doesn't really matter where it comes from. They have the right to express that and try to formulate law. Uh, the desire to create a safe learning environment is itself a moral conviction and is a demonstration of that very idea. Also, I've heard uh, the, the idea passed around that those who oppose this are, are bigots. Um, but restraining behavior is not bigotry. It's the essence of law. That is what a law does. It restrains someone's behavior. Preferably, it restrains the minority's behavior. And so, again, slapping such action with the term bigotry uh, is deceptive. It isn't helpful in advancing the, the discussion. Finally, there is an appropriate legal way to form policy to protect behavior if the American people really want to have that happen. The legal way, though, is not through the judiciary or through bureaucrats, but instead through our legislature. Thank you. Thank you for being here. John Wilkes. And Luke Shuck. Before my time starts, I want to applaud you for staying. You could have easily said, hey, our time is from 12.30 to 1.30. We're going home. And I appreciate you staying and listening to each of us babble on. Um, <laughs> I'm a father of four children, uh, two of which are still in the school system. I'm deeply concerned about the course of action uh, that this uh, referendum will take in regard especially to the bathroom locker room uh, policy. As a former school teacher and a 20-year veteran of working with teens, I could see devastating consequences from allowing a young person the option to choose which bathroom or locker room they will use. You're opening up the ability for our young people to legally view members of the opposite gender in the most private and vulnerable settings. It, it, it's not that I'm worried about the confused individual. I'm worried about the predator, and our schools are filled with them. Not because our schools are bad, but 
there are bad people that go to school like there are bad people that go to church and bad people that go to the grocery store. Teenage rape is already a concern in many high schools, and now we're opening the door for predators to feed their fantasies and possibly act on their desires because we provide them an environment to do so. It doesn't make sense to abandon the feelings and concerns and fears of 99.7% of the population to accommodate the less than three-tenths of 1% that call themselves transgender. The truth is, we know this agenda is not coming from students who are afraid to go to the bathroom. Yet, if we allow students to choose what bathroom they're going to use, you will cause a large number of students to fear using the bathroom at school. It would make sense to me if we had a one-stall, gender-neutral bathroom uh, for students to use, and I think that would solve the problem if we had a few of those. After all, the reality is there's only a certain number of handicapped parking spaces. Why? Because there's only a small number of legally qualified handicapped drivers. So you don't make every parking space handicapped because you have a small amount that want a handicapped parking space. In regard to why we're having this debate, we must decide, are we willing to abandon genetics, accepted science, and biology as fact, or will we consider what a person's desired self-image is as fact? If we choose a person's desired self-image over reality, then we have to question how this board is going to handle the 42-year-old teacher who truly feels inside he's a 16-year-old boy and ought to be able to have physical relations with students. If I truly feel inside me beats the heart of a Cherokee warrior, and I don't want to demean the lady that just spoke, but I can't put that on my college admission as a Native American because I really feel like that's the way I am on the inside. Uh, I'm not entitled to tuition assistance that a Native American gets. Does that mean I'm discriminated against and I'm going to suffer hardship, ridicule, and rejection? Because of what? Genetics, accepted science, and biology. I'm not Native American. Please, do not cave into pressure from special interest groups. They have no stake in the education of my children. Rather, listen to the parents whose children are being adversely affected if we choose this course of action. And I know you understand that whatever legislature you put forth, it will not stop bullying in the school system. So this won't help with the bullying situation. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Luke Shook and, and Luke will be followed by Terry Lynn Shields. Is it night yet? Yeah. Uh, Pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Luke Shook. I just recently moved here uh, from the dreaded state of North Carolina, I guess. Um, <clears throat> but uh, um, I, I came here not knowing what I was going to say. Uh, I got a lot of different insights from, from two different perspectives. And from my understanding of what the converse, how the conversation's been, it is the LGBT community is already unsafe in the school system. They've already given numerous accounts of being bullied, um, you know, not feeling safe. So with that type of environment, how is it that these people that are bullying them now, how is it that by letting them go to a bathroom or the locker room or being on a football team or a basketball team, I don't see how that's going to make the situation any better. I've got a nine-year-old girl and a seven-month-old girl. I have to make a big decision. Mm -hmm. I am the, I represent my family. Um, I am the father figure. I have to make the right decisions and the right decisions for my family if this passes is that they will not attend any public school here in Michigan. <clears throat> now, whether they go to private school or we homeschool, that's, that's my decision. But. From what I understand right now, the, you know, especially in Detroit, there's a big money issue. And in North Carolina, the governor is under attack and you know, the federal government is saying that they're not going to give them all this money and stuff. Well, are we making our decisions off, off of money or are we doing it uh, for what is right? Um, I do believe that there is an 
uh, an agenda that's going around our nation and throughout the world, I would just ask you to not cave into it. Um, the destruction of the of the family, and I would propose uh, may, maybe just well, I would I would propose a, an, an easy an easy solution uh, would be to get Jesus back into the classroom and to uh, once we start getting the teaching the Bible again. Uh, children won't be as inclined to be these, you know, bullies and haters and all that. So I would, I would propose to uh, start teaching the Bible again. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Okay. Are there two Terry Lynn Shields here? No, just oh. me. Okay. So there's two forms for Terry Lynn Shields. So can you come to the table? <laughs> <laughs> Creative, but no. <laughs> here, and then she'll be followed by Angela still, Vanek. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I'm telling Angela, Angela Vanek, she'll be after Terry Lynn. Okay. My name is Terry Lynn Shields. I am a mom of three grown daughters. I'm a grandma of ten, a great grandmother of three. I, um, I love the fact that you guys have stayed so late to, to hear every one of us. I uh, appreciate it. I'm excited about it. Um, however, I'm not excited about your proposal. Uh, and uh, it is not because I'm against LGBTQ. Not at all. It's because my grandchildren are not taken into consideration in this proposal. Uh, and uh, I think, to be fair, all children's feelings need to be considered. And I remember back when I was 11 years old, and maybe some of you do too, I'm sure you do, probably you're all younger than I am. Uh, when we went to gym class, we had to take a shower after gym. And it was so embarrassing to take our clothes off in front of other girls, much less boys. And if boys are allowed in the locker room or allowed in the shower rooms, it's gonna be even worse. And a lot of times I would take a demerit instead of removing my clothes, I'm, I'm not going to take a shower on it because I'm embarrassed about my body. Maybe, maybe you're embarrassed because it's too chubby or maybe you're embarrassed because you're not as developed as somebody else. This is a hard world to live in. We all grow up with our problems. But I ask you, please, table this proposal. It doesn't cover everybody. We need something that covers everybody's feelings, everybody's shortcomings. Mm -hmm. I ask you that, please, and thank you for listening to me. Thank you for being here. Angela Vanek, followed by Cynthia Peniak. Hi, thank you for this opportunity to speak. I'm a little nervous, so I'm just going to read what I wrote. Um, there are several concerns with this proposal, and I'm going to stick to a few that I see. This potential new policy is opening a door for misuse and abuse in many different ways. An open door policy also increases chance of sexual misconduct and violation. What would be the guidelines if these changes take place? Would there be regulations for everyone? Would there be staff monitoring every school restroom and locker room ensuring everyone's safety? As of right now, it seems the school district already fails with this. There are enough school fights that occur in the school bathroom and locker room as it is, and prevention isn't a strong suit in the school. I don't have any discrimination against the LGBTQ community, but I do have a problem with number three on the draft along with a few others. As a parent, I don't think the school or state should have the right to allow my child to keep anything from me, including their self-identity or in encouraging them in any way of sexual orienta orientation by promoting LGBTQ material material. This is creating a system of dishonesty. The schools should be responsible for teaching them work-based skills and a solid education and that's it. So where would the line be drawn for a secret lifestyle? The school and state does not take responsibility when a person from society fails to follow the law. And I asked my 11-year-old daughter how she felt about male students being able to use the female restroom or locker room at school as they saw fit for their identity of the day and she replied she would just hold it until she came home. My daughter was a patient for what is called nephrotic syndrome. 
We currently have it under control, but to hold her urine for an entire day would be medically dangerous. Where is the safety concern for all students? There needs to be a better way in our school system that is considerate for all students. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Cynthia Pentiak, is that how you say it? She here? Okay. Eric and Holly Heron. And they will be followed by, nope, Frank Dame is not here. Reverend Christopher Toma. Good evening. Good evening. I believe I've been waiting along with you about seven and a half hours to get to the spot. Um, I was a member of and am a member of the Michigan Education Association for 15 years. Um, I've taught in elementary schools. I am a parent of three daughters. I guess what amazes me is the boost you are inadvertently giving to the homeschooling community because traditionally people my age who are interested in homeschooling face a huge amount of pushback by their parents. And I am seeing grandparents and reading comments of them telling us to pull our kids out of the public schools because of this. I have a daughter in third grade and I am the type of parent you want in public schools. I donate my time, I support every child, not just my own. So for this counterproductive push to happen to the public schools of which I want to see succeed, it's tragic. I can't imagine what it would be like to feel every day that somehow I was a mistake, that something went wrong when I was made, and instead of the adults I trusted showing me that I was not a mistake and that I was exactly who I was meant to be inside and out, those adults encouraged my confusion and hurt. I promise you are not helping these kids by doing this. I listened to many transgendered individuals today and I heard their brokenness and I have compassion. And I think the reason the issue is so difficult is because those who want to stand on truth and science and fact being taught in our public school systems we have compassion for people who are genuinely conflicted. We see it. We don't know why. But it isn't helping anybody to put this proposal forward. I realize it's popular. It's a hot topic right now. But this is not right. For me, as a teacher, to be forced to refer to a child as a gender that is not on their birth certificate, I believe you are requiring me to falsify legal documents. Not only are you asking children to keep secrets, but you are asking us to lie. Aside from the issue of sexual morality, we should not lie. We should not keep secrets. And we should want what is best for all of us. I would never be unkind to people who are different from me. But there is a type of reverse discrimination where young people today are telling you they are going to homeschool their children because homosexual activists have all of the power in high schools. And anyone who holds a philosophical or religious belief opposite to that is persecuted. This is not an even playing field. And this is not right. We can do better. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Reverend Christopher Toma, followed by Tim Totten. Three minutes for a preacher. Is not <laughs> <laughs> we know you can do it. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. Um, I did not come with a prepared statement, although I have been um, listening and taking a lot of notes. And I should start off, first of all, by saying um, that I don't intend to speak from a theological perspective. I'll let my uh, appearance communicate to you where I most likely stand on this issue, although the church is largely at fault for being 
a confusing point of origin with regard to the word of God. Um, I do not support this. Um, now, again, I do not want to speak theologically, but I feel I'm doing a disservice if I do not tell you, um, as a, a called and ordained servant of Christ, uh, proclaiming his word in the world, uh, Romans chapter 1 makes it very clear that people wanted this, and they wanted this, and they wanted this, and they wanted this. And three times the Apostle Paul says, uh, and God gave them over. Uh, in other words, God gives up and eventually gives you what you want, and things come undone. Um, so there, I, I, I will leave that uh, theology. Now, as, approaching as simply a citizen, um, you are uh, serving me. And you are serving the people who have come this day um, to testify before you. Um, thirdly, um, I am the pastor of a parochial Lutheran school, and I can tell you for a fact that since this particular proposal came to light, uh, there are, are many, many requests coming to our congregation and school um, with regard to uh, parochial education. So I do believe that you will lose a lot of students over this issue. Um, now, uh, just to continue, talk, um, some observations that I've made at least, um, talking about um, how this is not a biological issue and yet the point has been made throughout with regard to what we desire to do biologically uh, just seems kind of silly um, to me. Um, second, um, I've noticed, I've heard, and I find it peculiar that a lot of the statistics on bullying and transgender and molesting and, all, and the like are largely connected to a common uh, denominator of single or foster family homes. Um, does this not point to uh, the importance of mothers and fathers um, together uh, in the family? Uh, and then thirdly, um, on behalf of the church now, uh, when the homeless need shelter, when they need food, when the scourge of war has decimated, has produced orphans, has produced widows. Uh, throughout history, uh, it has been the church that has come forward to care for these people for 2,000 years, a lot longer than any of you in the government. Uh, and it's somewhat of a straw argument to make the case against the church that we are unloving uh, or heartless. That's a, that's a false, false argument. Now, lastly, I have my 12 seconds or 12 minutes, as that one woman put. <laughs> um, I merely would like to ask you, what are the contours of this argument from this point forward? Um, I would like to know, as a citizen, uh, the objective contours of this statement or, or of this proposal. Where does it end? And that's a question I'm asking you. I know it's your job to sit and listen today, but you are in service to us, and I believe we need that answer from you. Does this end with transgenderism, or does it very soon include what is being teed up now as transagerism, which is I'm a 43-year-old man, um, but I identify as a nine-year-old, uh, but I also identify as a woman, and so now I have the right to access all of those services available to nine-year-old children? Does it go on to animalism? Where, where does it stop? Those are very important questions that mean a lot to the citizenry. And I would just simply put forth for the sake of the record that you won't answer me this question because you don't know. You can't answer it. Because once it happens, there's no going back. You've set the precedent. I thank you. Uh, please know that we pray my, me and my congregation, we pray for you daily. It's not an easy job that you have. You are loved in the Lord, supported in prayer. I pray you will be discerning to the citizens you serve. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for being here. Tim Totten. And following Tim Totten is William Wagner. Hi, I am the father of two young girls. And I couldn't stay at work. Uh, looking at their picture, I had to come and say something. I am adamantly against this proposal uh, uh, because of the observation of parental rights. I also want to call out uh, the economic ideology driving a lot of the way this was written, that uh, uh, 
the elevation of the creative class, elites to transform our cities creates great division, class division, and it's insulting to the rest of the lower two-thirds who are called out to serve them. And yes, this proposal is a great boost to homeschooling. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Ellie Tingsted and Tom, then Thomas Coates. Is Ellie here? Is Thomas Coates here? Is Greg Craddit here? City guys. <laughs> Jim Elias. Douglas Kelsey. Thomas Cusick. Gordon Rogers. Ronald Rashwitz. Tawn Belliger. Walter Luth from Midland, John Abbott, Cecilia Tombelli. Okay, so everyone's spoken then? Okay, and then I need to read into the record um, something from State Representative Lana Tice that she sent to the board, um, which is in input on this guidance. I am writing... I am writing today to express my concerns regarding the draft statements and guidance on safe and supportive learning environments for LGBTQ students. Below is an outline and summary of the concerns I have. Number one, lack of parental control. The lack of parental control and involvement is a major concern that must be addressed. Page four, section three reads, privacy and, well, you can find that in the statement, I won't repeat it for you. The section explicitly prohibits without the express permission of the child school districts from notifying a parent or guardian about the situation with their child. Per the board's own information, students who are dealing with LGBT feelings are at a higher risk for suicide and depression. The fact that schools would require administrators and teachers to keep something so dra dramatic from cold, students Jeremy. is wholly unacceptable. Number two, use of locker rooms and bathrooms. Sections four and five of the proposed guidelines would allow school children to use locker rooms and bathrooms based upon the gender they chose to identify with rather than the one that they were assigned at birth. Research shows one in four girls are sexually abused before the age of 18 and allowing members of the opposite gender access locker rooms and restrooms is opening the door for predators to take advantage of the system. Number three, sports. Section six of the guidelines would allow school, school children to participate in sports based upon the gender they identify with rather than the one they were assigned at birth. This means that boys could start in girls' sports like volleyball and softball. Undoubtedly, this will create an unfair athletic advantage as you will be asking girls to compete against students who have the benefit of testosterone, uh, which is a steroid, giving them an unfair strength advantage. Competitive sports teams at all levels are separated by sex for a reason and steroids are prohibited in sports because they give athletes who use them an unfair advantage. Even if one school district chose not to adopt these policies, their students could be disadvantaged when they play against a district who has adopted these policies. Number four, LGBTQ curriculum. My final major concern with the proposed statement and guidelines is the requirement for districts to include LGBTQ topics included in the sexual education curriculum and be provided in the school library. The board does not include age limits in the recommendations and I have concerns about how this educational information will be disseminated to our children. This policy certainly seems intended to indoctrinate, not educate our children, or it would consider the safety of all our students, not just a select few. I strongly encourage the members of the State Board of Education to reject this proposed statement. No child should be put in a situation where they are subject to potential bullying or abuse, but the answer is not to erode one child safety in order to benefit another. It is entirely possible to ask schools to provide single stall bathrooms for the benefit of any child who would be uncomfortable using a normal gender specific restroom or locker room facility. I thank you for your time and consideration sincerely. Representative Lana Tice, State Representative, 42nd District. With that, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the regular meeting, the Committee of the Whole of April 12th? So moved. It's been moved, supported. Any conversation? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed the same. Motion carries. John? Uh, one, thanks everybody for listening to everybody. It's really important. Um, I think the testimony we heard speaks for itself. I, I think the only thing I would say is 
it would be helpful to share with each other and w more broadly um, the list of the work group that worked to develop the guidance, make sure everybody has that, and the, the memo that, that staff put together describing their historic work in, in support of districts and the growing uh, requests and interests for more guidance, that would be another helpful piece of information. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage you to circulate the list of organizations that uh, have uh, weighed in, in support and in opposition to the guidance um, as well. I am going to forego my report at the late hour. Uh, I want to thank Rick. I know, Rick, this is your last meeting, meeting I think. Next You're next month is my last one. Oh, with this good. Is good. I was All right, good, then. We'll, we'll hang on. I then can we postpone your report then until... Um, you have something you need to... I just wanted to share something very briefly. Yep. Um, comments from a gentleman. His name is Rob Lawrence. He is the chairperson, I should say, the um, the president of the Birmingham, Michigan uh, School Board. He does not speak as a board member. He speaks as a father and as a, as a church uh, member. He says briefly, between the years 2009 and 2010, I helped teach our church communion class for eighth graders. One of our classes included a child who self-identified as a boy. Until that point, I never met or had conversation with a transgender person, to my knowledge anyway. The child was thoughtful, intelligent, and funny. The class accepted his gender identity without question. I was also accepting, but I was far away from understanding what he was feeling inside. Over the course of the year, true understanding never really came to me. How could I ever understand the essence of finding myself inside a body that didn't match who I was? Not understanding evaporated simply by focusing on the needs of that child. We saw him as one of our students, and it was our responsibility to help guide him and the others on a journey of personal passage and discovery. So it, it turns out that um, he learned, just as I've learned as a Michigan Teacher of the Year, a lot about this, this question of gender identity. To me, transgender girls are girls. That's, that, that is part of my evolution as a as Teacher of the Year this year. Also, transgender boys are boys, and, and, and that realization is, is key to understanding this notion of where kids belong and how should they... Um, where should they go? What should they use? Finally, um, I, I think that, you know, as an educator, I never want to cut out parents or parental involvement. I think that this whole notion of parental consent is really largely an issue at high, the high school level where there's a real visceral fear or a reality of being kicked out of the home. If you know that your parents or your responsible adult is, is not going to let you stay, will we'll, we'll disown you, then that's the impetus for this notion of why I you know, as an educator would accept the will of a child to say, call me by my, my, my gender identity name, call me by these pronouns, without necessarily consenting the responsible adult first. And, and that's something I think that also needs to be clear. To your point, John, if we could sort of take all these comments from all of these uh, wonderful individuals who came and, and shared today and, and revise this, these guidelines so that they, are, yeah, they just clarify some things, I think that would go a long way. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so our uh, next item is the, the approval of the nomination of Special Education Advisory Committee. Terry is here, but we're not going to ask her to report, only <laughs> if you have any questions. It is uh, the normal nomination process. I just had a couple of corrections in the information that was given to you. Um, there are a couple of terms that were indicated to be 2018 that should have been 2019. Um, and so I don't know if you want me to just give that to Mertz or she yeah, can we'll just it in a mailing to you. Yep. Okay. All right. We're going to postpone top 10 and 10. We'll do that during the retreat. Is there anything on state and federal legislative update we need to go through? Well, yeah, there was a statement created on a set of bills regarding seclusion and restraint. Um, so I'll, I'll pass and it on to you. And, and Michelle are going to introduce that. Do you want to actually just move it so approval? Or? Yeah, we'll just move it. Sure, let's. <laughs> yeah, I think everybody. That would be wonderful. <laughs> um, do I, do I move make a motion? Oh, I, I make a motion that we approve the um, this thing here. This draft. All right, it's been moved. Does it support it? <laughs> it's been moved and supported. I think the statement is in line with the action we've previously taken on the issue. There's nothing new here, I don't think, is there? No, it's but we'd like to talk for 15 or 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Eileen and Michelle, for working on this. Thank you very much for working on this. Did, did somebody support it? Yes, yes, it's been moved and supported. Any questions on it? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Anything else, Cassandra? Nope. All right. <laughs> consent agenda. I move support of the consent agenda. It's been moved. Is there support? support. It's been moved and supported. Any questions? So Seeing none, all in favor? Oh, sorry. The only item is the K, the endorsement of the letter assessment. Yep. Yes. Thank you. Any, uh, okay, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed the same. Is there any comments by state board members? 
I've already given the. Uh, <laughs> I can't even. You're, you're part of your commission. Yes, I did. Thank you. Education Commission of the States at lunch. Uh, I would just like to say I met recently with Ed Trust and they came out with this um, report, so I just brought a copy for everyone so you can read it at the leisure. Thank you. I'd just like to say I was very impressed by the testimony today and well, uh, everybody's views, but the people were very polite and yeah. orderly and respectful. Mm -hmm. and I think it was a I mean, it's exhausting, but an exhausting example of what one of the speakers said an example democracy. of democracy yeah. in action. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I congratulate all of my colleagues up there. Yes, we'll back. I want to go back to the agenda because you yep. skipped um, something very important for okay. the SB because we have a deadline of June the 8th, okay. and that's to um, elect or recommend somebody for president elect. Okay. And an area director, and then awards. But I guess you can go to your e to your email at uh, that uh, Marilyn sent, and if you have recommendations, you can send them to me. We if could could we bring it back up at our retreat next week? That would be before the deadline. Yeah, it's due date. Yep. Okay. Yeah, we can make time for that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. All right, future meeting dates, Wednesday, May 18th, board retreat. No official action will be taken on issues, although you may have a conversation on who you recommend for the board. Uh, Tuesday, June 14th, regular meeting. August 9th, regular meeting. Please tell them the retreat, where the retreat is. Michigan School, the Deaf in Flint. The retreat, May 18th, starting at 930 at the Seven. Michigan School for the Deaf. Have they moved the school for the in the same campus? No, it's in the same okay. campus. <laughs> we have Good. not moved. We'll send stuff. All right, with that, we are adjourning. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>